welcome to another episode of Skin Tributes. I'm one of your two hosts. My name is George Scandalis. And this guy over here is... Nathan Strong. How are you, Nathan? I'm good, mate. How are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm doing all right. Another week, getting closer to the holidays here, you know. We are pre-recording our episodes, for those of you that are wondering. So, um, we are recording these right before Christmas and the holiday break. What are we, when, are we, when does this one air? Is this one airing in the new year or before, Nathan? No, it's before. It's going to air before. This is this one, this this episode's going to be out before Santa comes. What? Wow. Well, look at that. Well, let's uh, let's start off uh, this episode, as always, by thanking the great gift we got from Santa this year, which is the sponsorship from Fullscript, because Fullscript is the ultimate platform for those who want to do wellness the right way. The personal way. It's got the industry's most comprehensive catalog of over 300 plus incredible supplements made from quality and their professional products. And it's making safe supplements more accessible and more affordable and making personalized treatment plans available from the doctor to the patient. I cannot stress this enough. I've only got 25 episodes to get this message across to you. Supplementation is a serious thing and should not just be decided by yourself or because your neighbor told you maybe you should take some vitamin D or because you read something where you think, you know, this is going to help with that or da 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 Get it directly from your doctor. And if your doctor hasn't heard of full script, this is an opportunity to tell them because they should be making those recommendations for you. I think that is very, very important. And for my smarty pants doctors that are already on full script, now you can order your products wholesale directly and sell them right out of your clinic directly to your patients. Beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Um, do you want to go to our guest or user comments? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I, I wouldn't mind a few user comments. Okay, well, let's do rock yeah. paper scissors. Before we, before we go to user comments, can I just ask a question? Don't you dare ask me. I'm gonna ask you. No, you're gonna ask me if I know how to say her name right. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask you that as well. But uh, have you have you gotten over J Lo? No, I'm not over this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not over. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, if she if she so much looked at me like I'd go into cardiac arrest, you know me. I'm in love with her. I'm obsessed with her. I would leave. I would leave my family, my home, everybody but my dog, just to be with her for the rest of my life. But I. I'm convinced that she may have told a little bit of a fib there when she said that she's never had any Botox done and that she just uses olive oil because I tried the olive oil thing. <laughs> I put my face right into my salad like that and boom, look at me now. So, no, I'm not over it. I'm not over it. I thought you were going to ask me if I know how to say um, Katie's name our doctor from the last episode well can you try it again belezne <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh i hope she watches this because i made myself i made such an ass out of myself with that one but you know what no one's perfect if that's the only mistake i've made all year oh. and you know it's, yeah. it's not so yes. bad um i'm really excited about our guest tonight i am too i'm so, very I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little bit of a of a, a special introduction to her before I go into her bio. I've got a nice long bio here, which we're gonna read. I want to tell you that I think throughout the scope of 2020 and watching it come to an end, you and I have had the opportunity of sitting with some exceptionally minded people in our industry and have gotten to meet people that you know we never thought we would have met had it not been for skin interviews. And it's really been an honor to meet a lot of those. But I'm going to be a little bit biased here and say one of the most exceptional minded people I've met um, in 2020 has to be our guest tonight. I'd agree with you. Um, and she's humble and she's modest and she's down to earth. And I don't even think she realizes how cool she is and how smart she is. So I'm really, really happy we get to have her on Skin Interviews tonight. And I want to read you guys... Um, her, her bio, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, it's Dr. Allison Young from the Seattle area. And it says here, Dr. Young is a board certified dermatologist and derma dermatopathologist. She's the fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology and American Society of Dermatopathology. She has been recognized as one of Seattle's top doctors by Seattle Magazine and Seattle Metropolitan Magazine. 
Dr. Yang enjoys all aspects of dermatology and is dedicated to providing comprehensive dermatologic care, including adult and pediatric and general dermatology, skin cancer surgery, and of course, cosmetic dermatology. She has a special interest in medical dermatology and dermatopathology and the early diagnosis and treatment of skin cancers. She completed her residency in dermatology at the John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, followed by a fellowship in dermatopathology at Brigham Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. She earned her MD from Whale Cornell Medical College and her PhD in molecular genetics and cancer research at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. After graduating from Douglas College, Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey as class of valedictorian with the highest honors in biochemistry. That's my girl. She was elected to be a member of the prestigious Phi Beta Kappa National Honor Society during her studies as an undergraduate at Douglas College. Get this now, okay? Because this is where I get excited. You know I love this kind of stuff. Yeah. Her PhD thesis focused on the study of ID proteins, transcription factors in regulating cellular growth and aging, cell death, differentiation, angiogenesis, and neoplastic transformation. Like my my mind just exploded reading it. Okay. Her her PhD is more exciting than my whole life. <laughs> her, PhD, her PhD is more impressive than my entire resume. Like, I don't even I don't think my brain can fit those words in it. Yeah. Development of knockout and transgenic models, her work attributed to this, the discovery of the biologic relevance of ID1 and ID3 genes and their expression during normal development, malignant transformation, and tumor progression. I wish I knew what that meant, but that sounds cool. <laughs> this work was published in in Nature, the world's most cited scientific journal and reported in the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, and CNBC News. Dr. Young was born in Taiwan and grew up in Singapore, where she attended Raffles Girls Secondary School, and she fondly remembers her house, Richardson. And H, I'm, I think I'm going to say this right, wrong, but forgive me if I do, and Hua Chong Junior College, she passed the Cambridge Journal Certificate of, uh, of Education, um, levels O&A examinations prior to attending Douglas College. When not taking care of her patients, she enjoys being home with her husband, who's an absolute gem because we've met him, and their three loving Havanese furry babies. She loves traveling and enjoys the opera and the dramatic arts, and mostly she enjoys spending time with Nathan and George, so <laughs> she agreed to be on Skin Interviews tonight. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most incredible people I had the honor of meeting in 2020, please welcome her to Skin Interviews tonight. Dr. Allison Young. Hey, 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 hey! Hello. <laughs> you, you, uh, we're good. You better live up to my 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 what I expressed about you today because I want the people to get to know you because I, I literally mean it from the bottom of my heart. And I know Nathan feels the same way because we talk about it a lot off camera. You are one of our favorite people that we got to meet in 2020. Well, I'm so honored and you've been so special this year to me. And um, I know that we talked about it at length. <laughs> <laughs> we have. We have. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I am looking forward to um, chatting with you. Yeah, how are the how are the puppies? Um, well, they have been very spoiled all day, and and now we call them TODs. That means treat only dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm very sensitive to puppies. Mine today, mine had surgery um, two weeks ago, and. Uh, to yesterday we went in to go get her stitches removed and unfortunately somehow one of her stitches burst oh. and so she had to have emergency surgery again today so she's oh. she's anxiously waiting for me to go cuddle her she's inside cuddling with my better half right now and she's probably like where's my dad where's my dad but uh she's gonna have to wear the cone of shame for two weeks over the holidays yes <laughs> she needs you <laughs> yeah she needs she needs her she needs her pops but those are furry babies. They need extra attention. Exactly. You can never give them too much love. Absolutely. Um, I want to start the show by saying congratulations on your new clinic, Young Dermatology. 
Well, thank you. It's definitely a labor of love. <laughs> Very exciting and very impressive um, that you opened during a global pandemic and the level of success you've already found. And I've gotten to meet all your staff and they're absolutely wonderful. If anybody's in the Seattle area, you got you to gotta head over to Young Dermatology 100%. And uh, to learn more about Young Dermatology, of course, as you can see on your screen there, right there, you go to www.youngdermatology.com med.com of course instagram is the young method because the young method is unique to dr young and of course we have facebook with young dermatology and if you have any questions for dr young you can always find her on linkedin at allison young are we ready to get right into the interview to learn all about the life that led you to that phd thesis which you're gonna have to tell me about Wow, that's a lot to say. In an hour. <laughs> More like it's a lot for my little brain to understand, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best. All right, let's go back to day zero. You enter this world, you take your first breath, and your parents decide to name you. Was it always Allison Young? Is there a middle name? Is there another name? And is there any special meaning behind your name? Um, I was actually named by my grandpa, and the Chinese name is quite different from Allison. Um, it's Ru Yun. It means to be like a plant in heaven with roots that don't rot. And that's because I'm the very first grandchild of this generation. And so I, I'm sort of the person who reminds everyone not to, re, not to forget um, your roots. Um, so that that really um, was the purpose. Also, my grandpa, um, although he um, is a fighter pilot and retired general, and um, he's a very romantic man, he um, had always read The Dream of the Red Chambers, which is in some ways a, a kind of a story of a, a, almost like a microcosm of society, Chinese society, um, back in the old days. And um, there, there was the legend of a, um, a beautiful plant in heaven, um, and that's how this origin uh, of the name came from. Um, so, um, but the but real purpose of it is for us to remember, no matter where we go in life, never forget who we are. Wow. And you were born in Taiwan, I think I said, correct? Yes. And do you have any siblings? Yes, I have a brother. Um, and he's older? i sorry, he's younger. He's younger. So I, I and um, because he's the firstborn son, so his name actually um, has the reminder of where um, we actually originate from. So my nickname says, don't forget, and his name tells you where it actually is. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so growing up, who would you say as children, were mom and dad's favorite? Uh, I would say that um, my brother is mom's favorite and I am my dad's favorite. Part of it has to do with personality. It just so happens that um, I am like dad in many ways and my brother is like mom in many ways. And, and so um, that kind of was the natural um, gravitation <laughs> towards um, each parent. Did that change as we became adults? Did, did, did the favoritism kind of shift? Did, was it more mom and daughter a little bit as you got older or did it always stay kind of the same? I think what's also special, there's a connection between my dad and I because I was brought up by his parents. Um, oh. So we're kind of separated. Um, and my brother was brought up by my mom's parents. So um, because of that, it's, it's a little complicated because of the shared childhood um, stories, we, we also had that um, um, inclination um, uh, towards um, understanding each other's childhood. Um, and then as we grow up, we um, I was away for the most part, to be honest, because of my studies. And um, I think my brother spent many more years with my parents. Beautiful. Dr. Young, I've got some photos of you growing up. I'd, I'd love to bring these up. Can you see these on the screen? <laughs> yes. Can you? So can you I, being the first child, you know, I had my parents to myself for a while. And you could see my parents and me. That's my first birthday. Notice the two candles, you know, you 
it, it's considered um, that you you are actually two years old um, when you're actually one when you were actually one year old. Um, and um, my favorite photo is that of my mom and me looking at the bird. For some reason, that I thought always um, uh, reminded me um, of that um, pure love um, <laughs> that um, a mother has for her child. And that's my brother. My brother's the one with no hair um, and a cat. And um, and I was, um, we were biking um, together. And of course, um, there is a birthday photo with all three of us staring at a cake. Um, and the third person in the photo, besides my brother standing right next to me, you can see the resemblance, is my cousin, Joe. And um, she's now a, a lawyer, a fierce lawyer in New York. Um, but that always cracked me up because uh, all three of us, our, our eyes are fixed on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We're so, both. <laughs> yes, so, Dr. Young, growing up as kids, what was something that you guys did uh, as a family that would sort of bring you together that you can remember? So um, I used to cook for everyone. Um, every Sunday, it was kind of uh, expected that I... Uh, I would make this noodle soup <laughs> with uh, many ingredients. I still remember it's a multi-step process. Um, and I, I remember making it um, and also everyone enjoyed it. And it's it's kind of something that um, my dad remembered um, the last time I saw him. Um, he passed um, He passed away last year. And um, I still remember um, how he thought of and remember this weekend ritual fondly. Oh, man, so, nice. um, so, so tell me birthdays growing up, is there a particular birthday that you remember more than others for being special? Um, you know, I don't. I think that um, um, part of it is that I, I've been away from my parents for quite some time. Um, but there was one birthday when I was 10, when I first joined them in Taipei, in the sort of in a different part of the country. Um, and um, I thought that was very special because um, for the first time, um, they got to celebrate with me again. Um, and my birthday is always on the third day of the Chinese New Year. Um, and so it's sort of, it's a little bit like being born on Christmas Day. Yeah. That um, the whole world is celebrating something very special right now. So your birthday, either we're all celebrating together, but it, it wasn't. It doesn't stand out. So that's what I meant. It's <laughs> uh, no matter where I am, um, it's sort of it's Chinese New Year, right? So everyone is excited um, because of Chinese New Year, and um, but then you know it's sort of kind of forgotten that, you know, or maybe not forgotten. It's always remembered, but then it's part of Chinese New Year. So it's very auspicious. And I'm very, um, I've always feel very fortunate about that and not a complaint at all. Um, um, but because of that, I think it's also associated with good times um, and a time where everyone gets together. So it doesn't quite stand out. <laughs> Awesome. And, and, and talk about your parents. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take a quick pause here. I'm getting a lot of feedback. I think, Nathan, it might be on your end. Right. Yeah, if we can just lower your volume down. I think it's picking up in your mic. Guys, you know what? We are, are we're on a live show here uh, taping, so anything could go technologically wrong. Forgive us, but we want to make sure that we can all hear. Let's all just do a quick sentence and say, I love George. I love George. I love George. Oh, you guys sound amazing. I love me too. Let's <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Thank you, George. So, Dr. Yang, um, back to your parents. What do you think was the most important lesson they taught you when you were growing up? I think the most important thing that I have learned um, at the time when I learned it, perhaps, in, it, it, you know, it was harsh, is that if you were to do anything at all, do it really well. If not, it didn't happen. So, um, and, and that I think is the most important lesson, no matter what you do in life, um, don't do it half-heartedly and do it really well, put your best in it. Um, otherwise it's as if you haven't done it. Why bother? Awesome. I like that. Well, I, I gotta say that I'm working with you, um, 
whatever you do, you do it really well. So, you know, you took that lesson to heart and you live by it. So that's excellent. Um, growing up, did you have a best friend that you are still in contact with today? I do. I um, I would say that um, it's my best friend, Inyu, in Singapore. And uh, she, um, she and I met when we were in high school. And I had the fortune to reconnect with her um, just two years ago. Um, and, and in Singapore, that's 30 years after um, I have left the high, same high school, which is the Hua Chong Junior College that um, that you pronounce beautifully. Um, and it was as if um, we have really never parted. I, I was quite um, um, stunned by um, how we reconnected so easily. And I was very moved. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. She um, has been very special in my memories. And now that reconnecting, it's one of the most beautiful moments in life when you could reconnect with a good friend. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing more special. Um, I would love to know, with somebody that's got your level of education and um, all the different schooling you've done, was there one particular teacher that really, really throughout your educational career stood out to you for either a positive or a negative that you'd like to discuss on the show? You know, I have always been very appreciative of my teachers. I, I think that um, um, somehow if there's one relationship in my life um, that really shaped me the most is that I take all my teachers seriously. Um, I do have to say that um, there was um, a, a particular teacher in high school, um, and she, I still re remember her. I think it's because of the influence that um, or the impact that she had made in my life. Um, she, it was her first, I was in her first class and this was at Hua Chong. And um, so I think that um, she's a very passionate woman. She really is giving her best, um, but somehow um, it, it, it didn't really quite work out. For instance, we, I still remember this. It, it, this impacted me so much that um, I cannot help but still remember it. Um, we was learning how to dissect um, uh, rabbits and we have to purchase the rabbit over the weekend and then kill the rabbit on the day of the dissection. Um, and um, and if I, I, I couldn't do it. So I was the disobedient um, student who went to the class saving all the rabbits. Um, and of course, I was boohooing and, and crying and um, made a drama out of her class, which uh, obviously was quite upsetting if I think about what she was trying to accomplish. And um, I felt apologetic to this day, but on the other hand, uh, to be very honest, I, I, I was beside myself. Um, and I, at the time, I wonder, how could I possibly make it to medical school? I, I can't, I can't do this. Um, but uh, years later, here I, I am, I'm a physician, and um, I do have to say that it, it's okay not not to be, um, you know, um, how should I put it, um, uh, be able to um, rationalize and separate your feelings um, while being a good physician. And I think that's what she has taught me, that mm. I will never forget. Uh, I think it's, it's the ability to be able to say, um, gosh, I feel so much compassion for you, but you know, I cannot fall apart when I'm taking care of you. Um, the melanoma has no feeling, but I do, and I know how you feel. So so I think at the time when I was um, a young woman, I think I was, what, 13, uh, or actually slightly older than 16, I, I couldn't really tell you why I, what I was weeping about and um, why my emotions are so stirred up. Um, but now I think on hindsight, that's what I learned. And that's what was coursing through my mind. But I couldn't really quite understand it. <laughs> you know, this, this triggered a response to me. And, and sorry, I know, Nathan, you want to take it away here. But did you did you have to do any sort of that stuff in, in high school, Nathan? No, I didn't. So we did we did um, frogs. And I think it was and I and baby pigs baby fetus like fetus pig fetuses 
But the thought, and you know what, now it, it totally triggered my memory because I completely forgot about it as if I put it out of my mind. But I remember we had to like use a scalpel and split it in two and pin it, pin all the different parts and then examine it and like do all the little like questionnaires and figure out what they were. But I couldn't imagine having to go in and having to buy it living and kill it myself than to have to dissect it to learn that that's got to be traumatizing well you know as we learn first you make friends then you betray them (laughs) 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 but that was too hard for me i I can't really do that i i I, you know i i think i'm socially unsophisticated that way but um that that was the difficult part It's going to be my favorite line of 2021. First you make friends, then you betray them. It's, it's it's so true, though. Like, my wife grew up in Poland, and before Christmas, they would uh, they would bring, like, the turkey in, and the turkey would be a pet for the week, and they would also bring the fish in, and the fish would swim in the bath for a week leading up to Christmas to keep, uh, to keep the food fresh for Christmas dinner. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 crazy. Yeah, so Doctor Young, I've got some photos here, and I, I want to bring them up. Uh, can you talk br- talk us through your family here? Yes. Um, so as you see, um, that's my husband and I um, on the right hand side. That that was our wedding day. Um, I had a very simple wedding. Uh, we met in New York, so we flew back to New York for the wedding. And I don't have human. We don't have human children, so we have three furry babies, um, and um, they're all three Havanese, and um, um, they they are really, I would say they run the house. <laughs> um, and um, I, I can't begin to tell you um, how much I, I feel that I should really work harder to deserve my dogs, um, <laughs> because they're so pure-hearted and um, just amazing. I think you learn a lot from um, animals. I, I really think you do. <laughs> I love that little photo. Where's that one from? Where you're that's pulling Cannon your hair up? Beach. Yeah, that's Cannon Beach. And um, Cannon Beach is is amazing because your dogs can run beach free. And um, I always thought that dogs are animals in captivity all their lives. And, um, you know, and they are happy in captivity, I suppose. But on the other hand, there are moments that we wish they can run free. And and that's where we used to bring them. We call it their yearly vacation. <laughs> So, so how did you and your husband meet, Dr. Young? Well, you know, it's kind of nerdy. I, it was my uh, first uh, PhD rotation, and um, I, I rotated through the Rockefeller University, which was part of their tri- institutional MD-PhD program. And my husband at the time was a visiting Fulbright professor from Poland. Um, wow. And so, um, you know, we we didn't um, really know that we will meet and we were on a project together. We we're looking at penicillin tolerance genes. So I often joke and we say we met while cloning together. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was a student fresh out of school and that was my first rotation in the PhD lab. And, um, and of course, he, he's a professor and he... Um, was telling me that, wow, you're really optimistic. So I had 27 clones while he was working with one. So I said, well, one could see it that way, but if this works, then I don't have to repeat it. Uh, Whereas he says, well, you don't understand, but 90% of research, you know, most of the time it doesn't work the first time around. Um, So I said, you never know. (laughs) Of course, you were right. Um, But um, that's that's how we met. (laughs) Awesome. So was it was it love at first sight or did you kind of grow on each other? You know, I've always liked him. I mean, the first I, I would say the first moment that I met him, I, I felt um, happy and I felt at ease and I also feel uh, very comfortable. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I, w- I wasn't making any assumptions because, you know, we, we were really there to work. Right. Um, but. Yeah. Um, I felt that if I were to look, and one day I was saying to myself, if I were to find a boyfriend one day, uh, I want someone just like him. That was what I was thinking. Um, and I I think um, I still have no idea why he fell in love with me. 
because um, honestly, I've been asking him that every day. Every time I ask him, he's like, stop torturing me. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I suppose that's most of us, right? I mean, you just love someone. Do you really need an explanation? I think he read your bio because <laughs> I fell in love with you from that. So. Well, we met before the bio, so I would say that he was very much part of it. I think the one thing that I think he did for me was to make me realize that if I put my heart to something, I can do it. Mm. Um, sometimes when you meet the right person in life, it's almost as if they give you wings. And it's almost as if uh, even if the wings don't work out, you know that there's someone there to catch you. So that's, I think, uh, Nathan, to answer your question, that's that's how I felt. I think that's, if you call that love, I think, I suppose, um, um, that's that's love. I, I feel that um, he's the right one. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. I love the way you explain that. And I, I agree with you. I think it's it's so important that you have that in a in a relationship. So let's let's get to some of the nitty gritty stuff in your relationship. Then, so who who wears the pants? Who who's the boss at home? I think Cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that she she is she knows that too. I think that she um, she runs everyone's life. She's the youngest and um, the most energetic, vivacious. I learned a lot from Cookie when I brought her to puppy class. I know that she's different from any other dog. Um, uh, but seriously, in our household, I, I do think that um, when it comes to the home, um, my husband, Z, um, does everything. And when I was an intern, I secretly asked for a wife. But um, he... <laughs> All the decisions at home, I make sure I I um, step out of it because I think someone needs to be the boss at home. Um, but when it comes to my work, I am the boss. Um, so I we tend to be bossy in our own ways. Um, also, he is a full professor with his own lab. So all his life, he has been the boss. Um, and um, But then now we're bossed around by our dogs, which I think is the, it, it's the fair revenge. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do the dogs have a favorite between the two of you? Well, you know, when we got Cookie 1, so Cookie 2 is the one who's running the house now, but when we got Cookie 1, Cookie 1 was really daddy's girl. And I have to confess that, you know, I love all my dogs, and I think that every dog should have a relationship with each person. You know that very well, George. Um, but I was slightly jealous. So then I said, you know, I, I need to find a muffin. So I found muffin, and, and she was just like muffin. She's the red gold table. But muffin is everyone's favorite, you know. You know, if there's a human being who comes to you and say, George, you are really my favorite, and then goes to Nathan, Nathan, you know, I have to tell you a secret. You are my favorite. <laughs> that would be my muffin. That's how she is. She's like a wonderful girl butterfly. So then I thought, hmm, then my friends are having boys, like human boys. And the m miraculous thing about being a mother with sons is that when you walk into a room, there's nothing quite like the feeling that you are the most beautiful woman in the room. So I said, you know, I need to find a boy. So that's how Taffy came into my life. And Taffy boy is mama's lover boy. So I said, do you think Taffy thinks Mama is the most beautiful woman in the world? And my husband said, you know, to be very honest, I think Taffy is rather worried that Mama has no hair. <laughs> That's quite true because Taffy has got the most gorgeous hair and he's often mistaken as a girl because she's he's prettier than everyone <laughs> It's funny you say that, you know what, uh, I'm pretty much like your dog because I go to all my nephews and, and nieces and godchildren and I'll pull one aside and, and I'll say, listen, don't tell your brother, but you're my favorite. And then I'll go grab the brother and I'll be like, don't tell your sister, but you're my favorite. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm Cookie. I'm, butterfly. <laughs> I'm like Cookie. Do you have a favorite song right now that you you listen to so every so often and you just let loose? Um, I used to like the fight song. Um, it's very a fight much. song. It's um, Rachel Clayton. You got to play it. Um, the lyrics are really fun, and 
I was actually looking it up last night, and um, there were a number of people who post comments. And some people survived breast cancer listening to it. Some people survived COVID listening to it. Um, and maybe look it up and listen to it on YouTube sometime. Um, I, I think that it helps to motivate you when, when if you feel anxious or depressed. Um, can, you, can you tell me a little bit just uh, some of the songs so I can find it? Um, if you if you Google the fight song, you'll be able to find it. I can't sing. I know you're trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, George, George, I think he's a little bit smarter than that. Have you seen the PhD she did? Uh, yeah, you're not going to put one past her. She All wasn't right, doing yesterday. Yeah. Tell me your favorite movie ever. Um, you know, lately I watch. There were many. I have many favorites. I mean, it's it's difficult when you have many loves and different stages in your life. You know, I I don't mean that I'm slutty. What I meant is, you know, I might have a professor used to say that one word to describe me is greedy, and I just lost. <laughs> so, so it's difficult for me to give one favorite, to be honest. But I have to say that my my most recent favorite, if I could say that, is my octopus teacher. Again, if you haven't seen it, Ooh, I think it's yes. So, um, and actually, my my assistant Judy told me about it. And then Judy has dogs, and Judy is an animal lover. And and when we talk about animals, we sort of resonate, you know. And so, um, and, and and true enough, I watched the octopus teacher. And you will never think that um, you will weep over an octopus, if, and you would trust me, you would. By the end of the movie, I was um, booing <laughs> over this octopus. It's it's so amazing. Um, it's amazing in different levels to understand um, how a man can have such a profound friendship with an octopus and what the octopus has taught us about life, about the little miracles in your daily life, about survival. It really isn't taken for granted at all and should not be. That's beautiful. If I were to make a movie about your life, which actress would you pick to play Dr. Young? So, you know, I actually worked, watched quite a fair bit of Korean drama. And um, I'm a big fan. I think that um, there's a lot to be said about Korean dramas. Um, there is a um, actress that I like very much. And you probably, if you don't watch Korean drama, you wouldn't know. And her name is Sun Ijin. And uh, she was... Um, recently in this series known as Crash Landing on You. Um, it's it's about um, the North and the South Korea. There are all these different um, fantasy movies about both uh, parts of Korea kind of connecting in very special ways. Um, I, I thought that it was really quite uh, um, um, amazing to see all her emotions. Mm -hmm. um, she was a very emotional actress in my opinion and, and sometimes it isn't just beauty but you can see different emotions course through her and um, I, I see almost um, my younger self in her um, because when I was younger I was um, very expressive even more expressive and very emotional um, and I show it so um, now I have to be a little bit more reserved because I'm getting older um, but um, I recall all of that. I think that I cry when I feel like I want to cry. I laugh and the whole world will laugh with me. Um, and, you know, it's um, that type of feeling. And I have absolutely zero reserve. I know it's scary to meet someone like this, but at the same time, and exhausting. I again recall my favorite Harvard professor who said, gosh, I interviewed Allison. I was exhausted. And I wasn't sure whether that was good or bad. But anyways, he <laughs> picked um, me for his fellowship. So I suppose that went well, um, whatever I said. <laughs> so, Dr. Young, before we get into talking a little bit about work and, and the industry, I want to talk a little bit about something that you and I have a huge passion for. And I've got some photos up here and that's traveling so talk us through some of these photos here right so um we used to travel really quite a fair bit there were times when we would um go to four different places and i love all my meetings and we also love to dress up um as you can see so on the left hand corner um z and i were in mexico actually in the right hand corner as well um on the left hand corner 
um, it's actually uh, Los Cabos, and the right hand corner is um, closer to Cancun on the other side. Um, so um, we were um, um, kind of uh, really um, uh, trying to explore different things that we usually never do. So, for instance, our first try a collage. Um, um, and of course, everyone is more impressed by my husband's work. And this always happens. You know, we go to Japan and we do flower arrangement and all the teachers are um, really complimenting my husband. And I sat there thinking, wow, I'm, I'm so untalented. Um, and, and, and that's um, and in the middle is when we're in South Korea. And, um, and I think that my husband was dressed as a, a royal official. Um, and um, I think I'm supposed to be the good wife. Um, but um, again, we were there and I saw all the Korean ladies come and take photos of him. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Everything was perfect. <laughs> He's always the one who gets the most attention. And um, following that, you will see my best friend and I in Singapore. Um, it, what's amazing about my best friend and you is that after 30 years, she looked exactly the same. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know how she never aged, and she has four grown children, and I have no idea how. Um, it must, she, it uh, must be all that Jennifer Lopez olive oil. Uh, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> there's. I, I think for her, for me, I I think it's her good soul. I think that um, I, 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 there's no one more angelic than my friend and you, and I think that if it's in your heart um, and you have a pure soul. Uh, that that's how you will look. That's how I always thought about my my best friend. Um, and then on the left side, where it's very colorful, um, that's actually um, in Italy. Um, we we were really um, uh, having a great time um, seeing Venice and all the little islands surrounding Italy. And um, I love all the colors. I've never seen a place with so many different colors. And um, and I put on a colorful dress just to match the building, <laughs> as you can see. Um, and then there I was dressed as a geisha. I still remember that day. It's kind of a the most beautiful and magical fall day. And um, it took me three hours to look like that. Wow. Um, and I had a, a um, team that um, usually dresses um, makos, which are, who are the um, apprentice geishas. And um, I remember she was um, transforming me bit by bit. And a part of the process includes teaching me how not to smile with my teeth and also to really look down and not um, stare people in the eye, um, which is <laughs> my usual New York style, I guess. And um, I also learned that taking a step back sometimes means taking three steps forward. And just because you have a strong point of view does not mean you have to show it. And that's actually a very nice Japanese saying. While the man is the head of the family, the woman is actually the neck that is turning the head. Um, and I think that um, that trip taught me a lot. I also think um, when I was a younger physician, you know, I was so very much focused on um, the signs behind everything and giving my patients the best according to my opinion. However, that actually is not what service is about. Um, if you are really with someone, the most important thing is how this person makes you feel. Right. And that's what I actually learned by dressing up as a geisha for one day, is how very grateful you are. And I, this may sound controversial amongst physicians or um, um, for anyone in the service industry, it's not to actually belittle yourself. You're very dignified, you know. But it's really to put the other person first and to know that we all play a role in life. This role does not exist without you. Mm. And because I do this, I elevate you. And this has worked so well. After I learned this, suddenly, wow, this actually, I had the wrong attitude all along. I was trying to convince you why this treatment works. I was trying to tell you how good I am. And I had my diplomas on the wall to show you that I'm competent. And I raised my voice. I talk with a full, firm confidence voice to encourage and engender and confidence. And I thought, wait, 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 wait a minute. How is that going to make your patient feel comfortable? 
So I decided to be a geisha. Well, don't get me wrong, to be, to have the servitude and the humility of one and to really understand that this is not how you treat people. Mm -hmm. So I came home from Japan and I treated all my patients like the most delicate rose in my garden. And I actually had better results because now I am really listening. And now my patients are also really listening because now they understand that I'm actually on your side. So I think this is a very important lesson to me. I love that story. And that's a, that's a great story for our listeners. And it's a good segue into my next question, Dr. Young. And it is, it is about our industry. And I ask all our guests this, and I, I'm looking forward to your answer, actually. Why do you think our industry is so great? Dermatology? Yes. Well, hands down, it's the best specialty. And there are so many reasons I can give you. It is, number one, the most diverse medical specialty. And why do I say that? Because my patients will range from an infant, you know, that I see in the ICU who is a new nate and came out with a rash who's three days old. And my oldest patient I've seen is 110. Wow. And I see patients um, of all walks of life. And that's social demographics. But it also means I have the fortune to follow you through life. I'm at the third generation now. And I know that once I reach the fourth generation, my time is up. But I feel very honored because most of my patients, I have been following them through this wonderful development. And we say we grow old together. But not only that, in dermatology, you can do research. You can be a basic scientist and you can be an applied scientist. You can do research in um medications and medical research, but you can also be a bench researcher. You can branch out to do the metapathology like I do. It overlaps with surgical pathology. You could also be a pediatric dermatologist, dermatologist, and you can also be a surgeon. You can be a mole surgeon, and you can also do cosmetics. Um, and you, because you can do it all, um, except for moles, I mean, some for me, I, I do all of it except for moles. Um, you you will never be bored, and the thrill is to walk into a room and you see somebody who has melanoma and you're minding on business. Oh, here comes a melanoma, and and you have to do something about it right away. And then you walk into the next room mm -hmm. and someone has hair loss, and then someone can surprise you. You never know. Every time I open the door and say say hi to a patient, I'm I'm always um, I'm always enthusiastic. It's almost that you're living through this over and over again, mm -hmm. the excitement of discovering what is behind that door. So I think that there is no other better field. And advances, dermatology never stops advancing. I truly think I'm blessed to work with and to be in a field consisting of the most brilliant people. I know this sounds cocky, and I know that I'm being biased. Of course, other physicians are just as brilliant. But what I'm saying is that our field keeps advancing. And now in medical dermatology, we have treatments that we never dreamt of before. And if we think about um, laser treatment, sur surgery, we are now doing all the different things that we have never done before, diagnostics, um, you name it. So I think that um, again, one of my biggest fears in life is boredom and being mediocre. And so I, I think this really suits me the most because at every given moment, I'm always learning. Um, so I think that's really tremendous. Um, this is the best field ever. If I have to do this again, I would choose dermatology over and over again. What an answer. And I just I love the passion that comes from you. And George and I have been lucky enough to work with you this year, and it's been an absolute honor. And we've learned so much from you. Uh, and just we've we've grown so much ourselves just from the passion that you have from this industry. And that brings me to my next question. And this is something that you taught us, and I will never forget this uh, as long as I work in this industry. But one thing you taught us when you first met us is Healthy skin is beautiful skin. Talk us through that. Well, a lot of times people come in with a different idea about what they need. 
this is how I discovered it. So people may enter your practice and say, I'm really here uh, for laser treatment. But when you examine their skin, you realize they have acne and they really don't need laser treatment. And when you're addressing their medical condition, when you make it right, and that actually is the first step. And also your skin wouldn't heal well if your skin isn't healthy from any type of cosmetic treatment. And a lot of young ladies don't really need any cosmetic treatment because all they need is to get on the right skincare regimen, for instance. And so sometimes what we read about or learn about on social media um, may be hype and may not actually apply to you. It's almost like saying, you know, we are trying to find a one size fits all approach. There really is none. And so getting to know each patient and really understanding what their skin needs is the goal. And there are so many examples I can give, um, but we'll be here all night. Um, I, I would say that it's important to have an accurate assessment of your skin and your needs. And that applies to all fields in medicine. And again, when you don't actually know the patient, it, it's really difficult to make the right recommendations. Do you think that um, based on that answer and based on the, the direction our industry has taken, do you think that the, the so-called cosmetic dermatology has really blurred the lines of skin health and derma dermatology in, in general? So I have never really thought of cosmetic dermatology as a, as a subfield or subspecialty. I, I mean, there are certain techniques, and if you really focus on that, you might call yourself a cosmetic dermatologist. Mm -hmm. I always thought that the medical dermatologist is the best position to offer uh, the best cosmetic treatment <laughs> because we truly understand the skin. And, and so sometimes it's really hard, as you put it, um, to really draw a line and because, for instance, it, I, I love my lasers. I love my vascular laser. And um, it can do so many different things. I don't just use it for cosmetics, meaning if someone, how do you then um, differentiate that between rosacea and someone with sun damage and someone actually like has a birthmark at the same time or that somebody has many different types of blood vessel changes at different levels that need a treatment. So you still need your medical judgment. And sometimes when treatments don't work, and I get this often because I'm a medical dermatologist. So the way I learn cosmetics is not through cosmetics by itself, by doing it from the get go, but learning the problems. I know it seems like reverse, but the first I will encounter is somebody who comes in and said, my doctor has done 10 laser treatments. It isn't better. I'm here for a second opinion because you're a medical dermatologist. Or that another comment may be, you know, I've had... Um, this laser treatment, but this brown spot wouldn't go away. Now I'm really worried. Uh, what are they doing? Are they not assessing me before they go ahead and laser the spot I was treated at a spa or something like that? So again, I'm not criticizing other people. What I'm saying is that there are certain times when you need a multi-modality approach, not just because combination approach always works better uh, while you're using different talents and different skills, but really because you need to understand the condition itself, and it's much more complex than that. I also, I also think we should touch on there about technology itself, because that also plays a role, the quality of the technology. And for, for the viewers that are not from our industry and don't know, a really good quality piece of machine is generally around at minimum, and I'm talking at very minimum, about 75,000 US starting. And a lot of these ones that can do multiple modalities that a lot of the dermatologists use are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're very different, the type of machine and the quality machine and how it's been serviced and how long it's been used. And if it's been used correctly, um, that you're gonna get it from somebody that has that type of machine, the result that you could get versus something that might be of lesser strength. I mean, you can do a home IPL, or and I think they have now laser hair removal that you can buy a home machine. You could do that at home, or you can do it in a clinic. And they're two very different things. And, and I think people need to be aware of that as well, because that will also um, affect results. The reason I asked the previous question, Dr. Young, is because I really believe that a lot of the things we look at cosmetic, and I'm not talking about the artistry 
of our industry as far as like facial anatomy and contouring and shaping of the face. But I think that when most people are discussing cosmetic, and at least my personal experience with it is that what they're really asking about is healthy skin and the skin processes that are aging and showing, whether that's broken blood vessels, uh, whether it's pigmentation, whether it's sun damage from younger years, that's about skin health. And, and, and I think we've crossed those lines into, into cosmetics um, or cosmetic dermatology. And I love the fact that you have that answer for our viewers to save. I want to know, if you could go into work tomorrow and there was only one thing you could treat for the rest of your career, which is a very th hard thing for you, I know that. But if there was <laughs> one thing, what would it be? You know, I would treat precancerous lesions. I would treat actinic keratosis. Because you prevent skin cancers. So oh, just along the same lines that we were just talking about, if there's one thing I would do is preservation and prevention. I feel like when I was in medical school, we all learned to arise to an occasion and a crisis. Even with chief complaint, patient comes in with this and that. And then when you look through everything, you realize this is this disease. And when it presents like this, it's what do we do? Or that people come in with a heart attack and what do you do? So you have a protocol. This is what we learn sort of to fix a problem. But I also think it's tremendous for us to prevent it. If we were to prevent a problem, then it actually saves the patient the most. I'm not even talking about money. I think that this is what I tell my patients and actually just today with actinic keratosis treated with photodynamic therapy, which is my favorite treatment. And I said to him, you know, I know that you will always enjoy the sun. My goal isn't to stop you from doing that. What I'm trying to do here is to prevent you from having any type of skin cancers that's actually going to deter you from what you love to do because the quality of your life is so important. You know, life is so precious as we learned this year. It, life is short, but it's also long enough for us to do something useful and meaningful. So let's not get distracted. That's how we, we think about it. I want to know either, you could answer either one of two things. The last book you read regarding, um, or, uh, that's relevant to our industry, or the last study you read, because I know you read studies, that really blew your mind out. Well, I would say I'm constantly trying to learn and improve myself. And you know, as I age, I also realize everything blows my mind these days. <laughs> However, I would say that if I think about something that is going to really have an impact and resonance and really leave a long lasting impression, um, this is not a, about the newest research or the most explosive finding. Because as when I was in research, I realized even if you think you are at the cutting edge Tomorrow, you're no longer cutting edge. In two weeks in research, you are light years behind. So that, there will always be something newer and better. However, I read a book that's by Dr. Atu Gawand. And he is a surgeon at the Brigham. And he wrote a book, he wrote many books, but one of the books is simply named Better. And this is a book that is very honest and really talks about the difficulties in medicine. And you know how we always seem to talk about everything with great confidence and we are the best and we have so many limitations and no one talks about money. No one talks about how modern medicine now is influenced by that so much. Mm -hmm. um, and in that book, it addresses many of these issues. Particularly, I'm a dermatopathologist. I was encountering a very difficult case at a time when I read the book. And this case taught me a lot about signing out a difficult, a borderline melanocytic lesion, and also how the surgeon interpreted it, how the patient interpreted it, and how the court would interpret it. And there are many medical legal issues involved. I thought that was such a difficult situation I was in. I was sweating. And um, I wasn't sure if anyone could understand the complexity of what I was going through. And when I picked up the book, I felt almost as if uh, Dr. Gawan was talking directly to me. And I also felt that there were situations when 
we thought we're doing our very best. And this is really what resonated with me the most. Every single day, I work so hard. I want to do my best. And I try to be awake all the time and not miss a thing. And I want my system to work. Sometimes even when the system fails me, I will still try to do everything I can to make up for the deficiencies in the system. However, let me tell you this, even when you have done your very best, you could still do better because there are situations you have absolutely no control over. And I actually had experienced that in medicine and despite thinking that I've done my very best. So I actually like the word better more than best or better than best because it tells you that the reality, which is what this book is about. I thought that was a very important message to me on a personal level as a physician at that time and even now. And so if a book can last you that, wow, I, it blew my mind feeling through this number of years, and this was 15 years ago, I would say this is a good book indeed. And wow. I, I think it's made an impact on me. Well, well you, t- you every time we speak to you, Dr. Young, you teach us something new. It's, it's amazing. Um, we're we're going to move into a topic now, which is, I think it's close to all our hearts this year because 2020 has been a challenging year for everyone. And we, we all know why. Um, and we, we asked our, our guests a few questions around mental health. And I think it's important that we talk about it because we, as humans, we need to talk about mental health more to each other and support each other in this area, especially in these tough winter months that we're about to go through. So my first question is, has, has anxiety or mental health impacted your life in, in any way? I think that as a physician and also throughout medical school, um, I guess I've always been anxious. And I wonder whether that's my baseline. Anxious not doing your best. Anxious that if you're doing your best, something can go wrong, as we talked about earlier. And anxious of the uncertainties in biology and medicine, like we're facing the pandemic, I feel almost as if the whole world knows the physician's anxiety (laughs) or not. But I think that um, that you cannot really separate from this career. I I just don't think it's possible to be very, very honest. And, you know, there's this one saying is, you know, physician heal thyself. I, I really think that um, for a physician, it's probably the hardest thing. And I will give you an example I experienced firsthand. Um, I lost my dog, Cookie, my first Cookie. Um, she was unfortunately strangled at a groomer's. It was totally a freak accident, but um, it was very sudden. I, I would wake up one morning, imagine, and my dog came back from the groomer's last night, and uh, I would sit where I usually sit. She jumps down the staircase. She has a ritual. She sits by my leg and then I go to work. But I noticed she was coughing blood and I thought I'm not a vet, but this is ARDS. And I think this is an urgency. So to cut the long story short, she passed away when I was seeing patients and I wasn't even there for her. And when on my way out the door, I said, uh, Cookie, you will be fine. This is how I talk, right? And Daddy will take you to the vet, and I will see you in a bit. And I never saw her again. And I know it was a very difficult day because I saw my patients, all 36 of them, as if nothing was wrong. However, I had a patient who was a physician who walked in, and he asked how I'm doing. So I could not help but tell him what actually happened. That I was crying in front of him. And after he left, he sent me a book. And he actually comforted me by telling me about how he lost his wife. And he said, you know, physicians suck at dealing with losses and grief because we've been taking care of other people all the time. So this is unknown to us and unthinkable to actually take care of yourself first. (laughs) So it's all right, I laugh. I think that I shouldn't laugh, but that's exactly how I feel. In fact, people will make fun of physicians killing over trying to save another person, even in movies. And so it is quite true. But I can tell you from my personal experience, and this may sound like a surprise, 
Your biggest comforts come from the most unexpected places. And there were moments when I was a younger doctor uh, where I was frustrated because I was trying to show how much I care to my patients. And some days, you know, you're not well received. I'm sure all physicians have encountered that. And you wonder whether you should quit now. And there are also times when you didn't mean for that adverse reaction or the outcome to happen. It happened. And I felt that I, I couldn't forgive myself. And every single time, my patients rescued me. And it wasn't the same patient. It wasn't any of that. It was through gestures. It was through the fact that I could still help them. It's also through colleagues and my own assistants who are side by side with you. And it's not really something you can put in so many words. And my poor husband, who is not in medicine, thank goodness, because then we can actually see each other. Um, I recall this very clearly. He's been waiting for me forever, and there's always a delay. I used to work in the hospital as hospital consult, and there'd be a three-hour delay when my husband was waiting for me in the car. And there was one time I came out, and I know he was mad. And I said, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, this is something I could not have prevented. And I was also mad because I was tense. And finally, I saw him. I feel like he's my biggest comfort, right? And how can he be mad at me? He's part of the vision. Didn't I get that? Um, but at that very moment, um, you know, I, I blew up and I said, you know, I, I'm not going to change myself. It, this, is, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what, you know, I have to do a good job. And this is my life. And, and my husband didn't say anything. Then he brought up an episode in the resident. And the resident like me was going through one day really um, – um, everything went wrong. And at the end, his girlfriend said, you're a smart guy. Why do you work as a doctor? Why don't you come with me and work for a company? And, you know, this doctor said to his friend that, well, I when since when I was a, a little boy, I had always wanted to be a doctor. And this is the only thing I know, right, that I want to do. And so I think by telling me this story, my husband had forgiven me and perhaps said sorry, sorry to me because um, I was upset that he waited for so long. So what I'm trying to say is that this little moment of comfort, you know, may not be psychotherapy that you envision or that um, it's something that seems um, like geared towards fixing a problem. It really isn't that. You have to find it in yourself and in your soul to be okay. Yeah. And I am okay because of my patients and because of my loving family. And because of my dogs, because you see that perhaps in their eyes or you feel it, you feel that love. And it works both ways. Because then when you walk into the next room, you show it and you are grateful. I'm, I was grateful. I'm still grateful every single day this year. I'm still alive through the ups and downs. And even the downness of the downs, I'm grateful because that tells me I'm alive. Being able to experience every emotion is what life is about. The quality of experience in your experience and your emotions is what constitutes your life. Being able to feel it and being able to make the best out of it, regardless of the real outcome, what, what tomorrow may bring is actually what life is about. And that is what I treasure the most. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, that is beautiful. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that story like it's just it's very very touching thank you so much so my last question before i pass it on to george and we go to the quick fire questions for the evening is you get the chance to go back in time and meet yourself as a resident doctor what is the one piece of advice you would give yourself back then as a resident doctor for with what you know now well, I would have said to myself the same thing one of my professors said to me, don't worry, it will only get worse. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Wow. Because what that really he's saying to me, you know, it's not that it will get worse, it's that you will get better. Mm. But he didn't actually say it. I like that. That is so good. I like that. All right, Dr. Young, we're getting towards the end of our episode, so now it's time for 
to lighten things up with our quick fire questions, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I want you to blurt out the first answer that comes to mind without putting too much thought into it. And you are allowed one pass. Fair? That sounds scary, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it won't be too scary, but you can use your pass at any time, but you're only allowed one. So make sure you save it for the right question. Okay. What is the favorite, your favorite thing in your closet right now? Um, my green dress. The one you're wearing tonight? Yes. It's beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Um, what's your guilty food pleasure? Chocolate. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Milk chocolate. Uh, if you had to pick, sour candies or ice cream? Sour candies. Sour candies or milk chocolate? Sour candies. Ooh. Okay. If you could be from any other decade or era, which would it be? This era. I need flashing toilet and plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, iPhone or Android? Android. Any tattoos? No. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Talk to animals. Ooh. Do you prefer texting or talking? Talking. You can either speak every language in the world or talk to animals. I can't have both. Nope. <laughs> nope. Actually, I will speak all languages in the world. Okay. Uh, white or whole wheat? White. French fries or potato chips? French fries. Um, you're going to the dermatology event of the year. Which designer is dressing you? Well, I don't know. I think um, my favorite designer passed away. Gosh, I didn't remember his name. Um, I have several of his dresses. Um, gosh, Italian. What is his name? Gianni Versace? No. Um, Really, I don't know if he's Saint Laurent has passed away. No, I don't think I don't think he's from Italy, but I I need to. I, I you'll um, be back to us on that. Yeah. COVID restrictions lift off tomorrow morning. Where are you traveling to with your husband? Japan. And you get to have dinner with God and ask him one question or her because we don't know. You get to ask God one question. What would you ask? Gosh, um, is there really a heaven? <laughs> it's good. Okay. Sure. And your house is on fire. You, All the dogs and your husband are safe, but Nathan and I are upstairs. You can only save one. <laughs> Who do you pick? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> So, which one of you can jump um, from heights? <laughs> <laughs> That's Nathan. Nathan, I, I can't jump. I can eat sour candies, though. <laughs> okay, then I'll save you. And then I'll save you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. You know what I feel good about? She didn't use the pass. She knew. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because she knew. First, whether he can save himself. Yeah, she knew that I was going to be safe. Yeah. It's either, either she knew you could jump or I wouldn't fit through the window. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dr. Young, it has been um, an awesome, an awesome opportunity to have you on Skin Tributes tonight. Um, you know, I, I really mean it when I say you're one of the most interesting people I met in 2020. And, you know, sometimes when I meet really great people in my life, I think, Gosh, you know, why did why did my life path bring me to the point where I met them at this stage and not and not earlier? Because um, you know, there was times in my life where I had a lot more free time to learn so much more. And now I I really struggle to find time to read studies and do the stuff I gotta do. Nathan talking about it all the time, but 
Um, you know, you're you're a remarkable human being, and you have so much passion in you. And I love that you don't want to ever be mediocre because I don't believe you ever could. And I think that that you hold true to that. And I can't wait to read better. I'm glad you will. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I know Nathan has a couple questions before we uh, we wrap up the show. Yeah, so Dr. Young, it's called Skin to Views. We can't let you leave without uh, talking about your skincare routine. So can you let us know what your current skincare routine is? Well, I am using the Vivier uh, hyperpigmentation program. Um, so I begin with a medicated salicylic acid wash, which actually helps with both reducing um, breakouts, um, I don't really have breakouts, but I do have clog pores and pigmentation. And then I like the vitamin C serum with Arbutin because I am prone to having pigmentation issues. And that has no hydroquinone. Um, and then I would follow through with Arbutin cream. And then in the morning, I would um, occasionally use the exfoliant forte, which has lactic acid and glycolic acid. Amazingly, that actually could be tolerated if you use it sparingly and then followed by sunscreen. And in the evening, then I'll follow through with retinol. Um, I think everyone should have a retinoid, and this is the one that I could actually tolerate. Um, so that's what I've been using. I really think it works. Um, I think that sunscreen and vitamin C serum are non-negotiables, and retinol and retinoids are too, and hydrating your skin is key. Um, and that's, that's always a must. I love it. Awesome. So, so viewers out there, if you're in the Seattle area, you've got to get down to Young Dermatology and pay Dr. Young a visit because uh, as you can see tonight, this lovely lady knows what she's talking about and she has a wonderful, wonderful way of uh, looking after and caring for her patients. And that's why George and I have fallen in love with her this year and we've just, we've loved our opportunity uh, working with her this year. It's, it's been wonderful. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Young, for, for coming on the show. Um, it's been a, a wonderful experience. And it's been great for us because we've got to get to know you at a different level tonight. And it's been fantastic. Thank you for sharing uh, so much with us. Thank you. I'm so grateful to the two of you. I think that you've empowered me in so many ways this year. Thank you. Stay uh, stay tuned. We're just going to go to a quick message from our sponsors. I'm going to say goodnight to our viewers and stay backstage so we can say a proper goodnight to you and happy holidays. Another episode of Skin Interviews, ladies and gentlemen, comes to a close, and we're getting closer to the end of 2020, and it's it was a really special interview for me tonight. Uh, Dr. Young is somebody that we met when Nathan and I first uh, decided to start our, our new company and begin on our new venture, and it was evident to me right from the beginning that if it was somebody we hadn't done business with, it would be somebody that I would love to stay in contact with for the rest of my professional career because there's so much passion there. And there's it's not just the passion, but it's also the compassion that comes along with her. And then all the education and the knowledge. And it's it's quite beautiful to see it all encompassed in, in somebody like Dr. Young. I love that her parents named her, and I may say this wrong, and it won't be the first time I've said something wrong on the show, uh, Ru Yin is her Chinese name, which means roots in heaven and how it focuses on the roots and where we come from. In this holiday season, I want us all to focus on where we come from and who are the special people in our life and the families and the stories and all the ups and downs and the hardships and the great moments and the successes and of course the failures that have led us to today because when you're watching this, wherever you are, what's going on, no matter what's happened, you've survived. And we've all survived this global pandemic collectively. Some of us have not survived per se, 
But the ones that are able to watch this episode up until now, you've gotten through this. And there are people that have lost their loved ones. So look at where you're from. Look at what's going on around you. Embrace your roots, embrace your family, love each other, show compassion to your neighbors. And you never know when someone just needs to say hello or, or be heard or talk to. And be that confidence that Dr. Young talks about in anyone's life. It could be a stranger. Give them wings. You never know who you could be dealing with. I read a quote today that was absolutely wonderful that it said, what if the cure to cancer is trapped in the mind of someone who cannot afford an education? And that is why we need to encourage and lift each other up every single day. What if the cure to COVID was trapped in the mind of somebody that couldn't afford an education? And how many other illnesses are there out there that we can't afford to back pharmaceutically to get vaccines and get everything moving forward. So embrace each other, love each other, continue to raise each other up, and we'll collectively always get through it. Have a wonderful day, evening, or night, no matter when you're watching us or if you're listening to us on Apple, Stitcher, or Spotify, which we love to see all those little downloads of the episodes being heard. And I want you to take care of your skin, and I want you to have an incredible holiday season and embrace the time now. And we'll look forward to 2021 when it comes along. But deal with now. Now is the time to do it. Take care of your skin. Now. Or I'll find out and I'll kick your butt. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.